Everybody, welcome to review session number one for the AP test and your final. Um, I have a bunch of these made up. I'm hoping that with us not having to do all of chapter, all of our final chapter, since we're only picking and choosing a handful of topics, that um, I hopefully won't have to be doubling up on these. We might be able to finish all those topics and what we would do during the day. I would just give you the video of these reviews. But to start with, initially, I do want to get a couple of these done just to make sure we get them done by you know, May, whatever, whenever they come up with the date that you guys are going to have to take the test because that date's going to be changing. So um, this is review number one. These are all by topic. This one is the very beginning of the year, just different rates of change. Um, average rate of change in particular will be definitely something that you're going to see in the AP test. Um, and then also some limits and continuity. So we'll go through this. Um, this is one of our quicker ones um, and with me just basically going through this without chatting or questions or anything this hopefully will go reasonably quickly so one of the big things you're definitely going to see on the ap test even the abbreviated version of the ap test is the average rate of change formula um, it's basically your old slope the main reason you're going to see this for certain is really what we do a lot of is derivatives and then anti-derivatives and the big thing about the average rate of change formula if we look down here at number three what i have in bold and what i have in here underlined and italicized is the average rate of change is how we can approximate a derivative if all we have is like a table a set of data here where we can't really find a derivative we have to have an approximation tool and the average rate of change is one of those so almost without question this will be something that you're going to be testing on when we do the ap test there'll certainly be at least one question if not more than one question with that idea in mind okay um, so that's something to just be aware of. You're definitely going to want to um, know all of that. So let me try to get rid of this. All right, maybe I can't do that. Um, there we go. So there's a couple different ways you can get asked this. Um, one of the ways is if, if we're asked to find an average rate of change is just the old-fashioned f of b minus f of a over b minus a. So for this problem, since we're going to be going from 2 to 6, we would do f of 6 minus f of 2 over 6 minus 2. All right, and then whatever that gives us would be our average rate of change. Um, so f of 6, if we plug that into this function, would be, what is f of 6? 36, 72 minus 18. So that would be 54, right? Yeah, 54 minus, plug in your 2, uh, that would be, be what 8 minus 6 so 2 and then over a 4 so what is that 52 over 4 our average rate of change would be 13 okay that's how you do in a standard problem very very unlikely that's what you would have to do but um, I have seen it before what you will have to do for certain is you'll be given a table and if we look at our table here you're told this is a velocity table if you look at A and B, they're both asking you to find an acceleration. So we know the, what we have to do in terms of position, velocity, acceleration. If we're at a velocity and we ultimately want to go down to an acceleration, we would need a derivative. But we can't take a derivative if we don't actually have a function. So all we have is a table of values. So the average rate of change is our best tool to approximate what our derivative would be if we could have taken it. So one way you can do it is if you're just given the interval. All right, 0 to 25, so just like number 1, uh, we would just do f of 25 minus f of 0 over 25 minus a 0. We can go to our table to figure that out. Um, this would be even better off written as v of 25 minus v of 0, so our velocity at 25 and our velocity at 0. So that would be 70 minus 0 over 25. Uh, what's that reduced down to 14 fifths I think um, and then now the reason this is really common also is because this will test you on your units so the reason this acts as an acceleration is the 70 and the 0 would have had units of feet per second your denominator had a unit of seconds so when we do that our unit ends up being feet per seconds per seconds which is feet per second squared all right, so it takes us from velocity to acceleration. They can do that. The most common type is this type, and we certainly have done this throughout the year, so this shouldn't be anything crazy that we haven't seen in a while. 
where they're asking you to find an acceleration from a velocity table at a certain time. Okay, well, when that's the case, we would go up to where 13 would be. So if we look at our domain here, our times, 13 is in between for this set of data, 10 and 15. So we would set up an average rate of change problem with the point directly in front of 13 and directly behind it. So that would be f of 15 minus f of 10 over 15 minus the 10, and then we get those values from our table. So we would get 30 minus 20 over 5, um, and then again, these had units of feet per second. The 5 is a unit of seconds. Simplify that, and we would get 2 feet per second squared. Okay, so if a function is your position function, then when we do the rate of change, that's going to be your velocity. What we just did, you were given a velocity function or velocity values. Uh, the average rate of change is going to be your acceleration. So again, the big key here is this idea that it approximates the value of our derivative when we can't find our derivative. We then get into the formal definition. Um, the long formula, limit as h goes to 0, f of x plus h minus f of x, the whole difference quotient, and the limit of the distance quotient. Um, so it's all the same as above. The derivative of position is velocity. The derivative of velocity is going to be the acceleration. Uh, number three, in order for a derivative to exist, we have to be continuous, cannot have vertical tangents, cannot have sharp corners. Typically, that's a guaranteed question on the AP test as well. Again, with the abbreviated, blah, the abbreviated version, I can't tell you that now. I don't really don't know what to expect with it, but certainly that's something that you would want to know. The two things, or the idea that connects those is what was the mean value theorem? The mean value theorem guaranteed that, so what I had you do is if here was A and here was B, and we had a function, so long as it is continuous and differentiable over an interval, um, <clears throat> the mean value theorem must be true. And that guarantees that the instantaneous rate of change somewhere in there is equal to your average rate of change. So when we did this, I had you kind of sketch out a point from A to B. We drew in an average rate of change line, which is your secant line. And then what we talked about is there's at least one point, probably right about here and right about here, where the tangent line, which is the instantaneous rate of change, would have the same slope as your average rate of change. But again, it has to be continuous, so no holes, jumps, discontinuities, um, infinite discontinuities. And it has to be differentiable, so none of these things could be occurring. And if that's the case, then this is guaranteed to be true. All right? If there's a sharp corner or something in between, then it's not necessarily true. All right? So instantaneous rate of change, set it equal to your average rate of change. Wherever that solves to be it has to be your average or your, um, your time when those are equal to each other. And then the last little thing, this is something we haven't done in a very, very long time to determine if a function is continuous, unless we can just look at the graph, what has to happen is we need a functional value. The f of a must exist. The limit as we approach that x value of a needs to exist. And then the third thing that we always talked about is basically step one and step two have to be equal to each other. Our functional value and our two-sided limit must be equal. If we can check all those um, requirements off, then our function is guaranteed to be continuous. Okay? So what the packets mostly are, the first page or two, a lot of times this kind of sets up the big idea. And then what I have is a bunch of old AP questions, a bunch of old prep questions from different resources um, that you can get in the bookstore or online or whatever. And we kind of go through and just see the way that these questions have been written over the years. When we read through them, you really want to understand the questions in a little bit more detail. So we really want to start to understand why are we given all this information here? How does that um, factor in us answering the question? So for this one, um, <clears throat> when this tells you that your function is continuous and differentiable over an interval a to b, and then the same thing here, a to b, and then it starts asking what could be false, what could be true, almost without fail, that's referring you back to, and it won't be, you know, certainly they won't necessarily always say the words, but when they start talking about something being continuous 
and differentiable and start asking you what must be true or what must be false, in some way, shape, or form, they're probably testing you on the mean value theorem. Okay? So that's important for this problem because when it tells you now that your function is continuous and differentiable and now it starts talking about true and false, at some point they're going to probably test you on the mean value theorem and they do that right off the bat in letter A. So if our function is continuous and differentiable, one more time, we'll refer back to the previous problem here. If we are continuous and differentiable, the mean value theorem must be true. So for letter A, in this first problem that we're doing, if I can get it to come back, this one absolutely must be true because it's saying your instantaneous rate of change is equal to your average rate of change. This is the mean value theorem. This guy must be true. So we're definitely not picking that one. Okay. Now, some of these other answers, it's hard for me to find a question where they're testing on one exact idea. So the next couple we're going to talk about is these two. It's a, something we'll deal with a little bit later in a, in a further review packet where um, your function has to have a minimum, your function has to have a maximum. So one of the things that we would have talked about is what was called, and this is for this problem, the extreme value theorem and what the extreme value theorem said as as long as we have a continuous function on a closed interval which we do so reference back to right here we are continuous on a closed interval then you are guaranteed to have both a maximum and a minimum. There's no way we could not have a maximum or a minimum. So when you look at C and D, both of these guys have to be true because we are dealing with a continuous function on a closed interval. So we have to have a minimum, we have to have a maximum, okay? Then letter E, we haven't really talked about this, so you might want to definitely make a note of this. It's not a terribly difficult idea. But if you are told that your function is differentiable, which we are here, that then guarantees on the same interval that we also are anti-differentiable. Making this guy also true. So what we're left with ultimately is B is our answer. So then what we would want to kind of show is how could this statement be false? Because it definitely could be true. I mean, that's certainly possible. Um, I'm trying to create a little space here so we can erase this. Um, but here's how I would show this. <clears throat> um, yeah. So if we took this guy here, um, draw on a function that's continuous and differentiable from A to B. And if we went ahead and did something like, so here's A, here's B, if we drew in something that looked like this, then yeah, we could definitely get a slope of, oops, of zero here, okay? But it wouldn't be hard for us to draw in a function that is continuous and differentiable. I mean, we could draw a line, we could draw something that looks like this. This is a continuous and differentiable function on a closed interval. This is a continuous and differentiable function on a closed interval. But nowhere in between these two points do we have a place where our slope is zero. Here our slope would be constant if it's a line. Here our slope is always positive because we're increasing. We don't ever have a slope of zero. So that's the one that could be false. Okay. Big idea take away from this problem. Continuous, differentiable, almost always when they start talking true, false, you're going to have a mean value theorem idea, okay? And then, you know, a lot of this then puts together a lot of our theorems. Extreme value theorem, we have to have a max or a min if it's continuous on a closed interval, okay? Next couple problems are pretty straightforward. The graph above um, has a vertical tangent at 2, 0. So if I go to 2, 0, they are telling us that this graph goes vertical right here. So that should send off some alarm bells. You have horizontal tangents here 
in here. And then it says between a negative 2 and 4, for what values is your function not differentiable? So we talked about it earlier. You're not differentiable if we aren't continuous, if you have vertical tangents, or if you have sharp corners. So if we look at this problem, we have a discontinuity here at the x value of 0. We have a vertical tangent at 2. So 0 and 2 is when our function is not differentiable. 3. <clears throat> Again, they like these questions a lot because they can test you on a bunch of ideas all at once. Uh, the graph of a function f is shown above. Which of the following statements about the function is f? Uh, about f is false. And this shouldn't take very long. Um, when this says a, your function is continuous at a, if we come up here, pretty obviously that's not continuous. We would have called this a point discontinuity back in the day, where the point is basically removed from our graph. So that's pretty much our answer. That's a false statement. Just to make sure we understand these, we do have a maximum at a. So if I go to a, this point is defined, and within its general area, so immediately around this point, that's a high point on our graph, so that is a max. When it says x equals a is in your domain, that means if I go to a, do I actually have a point? We did. It's right here. It's defined, so that is in our domain. The limit as I approach a from the right is the same as the limit as I approach a from the left. And then um, this basically a and d are the same exact question. This is a two-sided limit, which means the right-hand limit and the left-hand limit needed to be the same, and they are, they're both A, or I'm sorry, they're both whatever this value right here would have been. So these are definitely true, okay? Um, four, I will give you a list of graphs that you need to know without your calculator. This would definitely be one of them, and if you know this, this should be a pretty simple little question, and I think we do all know that. It's an absolute value graph, no shifts in it. So 0, 0 is our vertex, and it would be opening upwards. If we know this, this question should be pretty straightforward. Which of the following statements about f are true? So if we go to the first statement, are we continuous at 0? Yes, for sure. There's no holes, no gaps, jumps, anything. Are we differentiable at 0? That would be a false statement because we know the absolute value graph at the x value of 0, you have a sharp corner. So that's a problem for our derivative. And then letter or Roman numeral 3, does your function have the absolute lowest point in your graph at x equals 0? That's pretty obviously a true statement. So 1 and 3. Okay, so those are pretty nice. All right, if we go to the next page, oops, uh, number five, this is an interesting one. This would be one that if, you know, we were there, I'd probably make you think about it a little while. I won't make you stress on it. You can pause me at any point in time if you wanted to try some of these and see if you can do them on your own before you get the explanation. That's probably a good strategy if we're doing these online. This would be one I would say, take a minute, pause me, see if you can come up with it. Um, it's telling you that let f be a function defined and continuous on a closed interval a to b. So now, when I said earlier, you really want to understand what these questions are giving you and also what they are not giving you. So if we went back to the very first question, they told you that you were both continuous and differentiable. This question, if we now read it, they tell you that you're defined and continuous but nowhere did they tell you that your graph needed to be differentiable. So that is something we want to pick up on. That's going to play a role in our answer. We do not have to have a differentiable function. We do need to be continuous, and it does have a closed interval. Then it says, if a function has a relative maximum at C, and then C lies in between A and B, which of the following statements must be true? All right. So the way I would kind of explain this if we were together, I would probably have you graph this. I would tell you to pick an A. Let's say A is over here, and then obviously B has to be over here. And then C is in between A and B, and it must be a high point in our graph. All right? C is a maximum, and it lies in between A and B. So I'll put C here. 
and then this would have been what is going on right now this would be b what they are anticipating people doing is drawing in a graph that looks like this that's what most people would do and let me make sure this is nice and smooth all right if that's your graph and we now go through these don't ask me why that's blinking um if I go to letter C and this asks, does our derivative exist at C for the graph that I currently have, you would say that that's true. You would say, yeah, that's a true statement. Two, if the graph did exist, which right now we said it did, does your slope equal zero? And it would. We have a nice horizontal tangent line right there. And then the third one, if the second derivative would exist, then the second derivative would be negative. So a second derivative, so again, we'll hit on this um, in a couple of review sessions. The second derivative negative means you have to be concave down. If we look at this graph, we are definitely concave down the entire time on this graph. So for us right now, that would lead us to believe that all three of these are true. The nice thing about this old question is none of these options included all three answers. If it was, then probably a lot of people would have picked that. So we have to rethink then what happens how we could draw this. What we're ultimately saying, which of these must be true, how could we contradict this really? So if this is A, I don't know why this, sorry, this is a PDF and normally I have a Word document, but I couldn't find my Word version of this. This is an old one. Um, so I just have, I just scanned it. This is behaving weirdly. Uh, pick C, make that a max. So now what we can now do, since we do not have to be differentiable, again, that doesn't have to be the case, we could have connected A to B like this. And then, let me do that differently. Let's just make it real obvious. There's nothing saying, and it's hard for me to draw straight on this thing. Here's C. Let's just say I drew a straight line. Pretend that's a straight line. And pretend this is a straight line. So that what we ultimately have here is a sharp corner. Still satisfies everything that it needs to satisfy. It's a defined function everywhere in this interval, and it is continuous everywhere in that interval. It also has a max at point C. So everything that needs to be satisfied, we are good. But what that now allows us when it says which of these statements must be true, number one does not have to be true. We just showed that right now. If we have a sharp corner, F prime does not exist. <clears throat> so right now, that's one that we want to include as things that doesn't have to be. Which of the following statements must be true? This is the one that we can get rid of. That doesn't have to be true. Number two is saying, if it did exist. So if it did exist, then we can't have the graph right here. Because then it doesn't exist. So if it does exist, that means we are dealing with this one here and our slope would have been zero. So that would have to be a true statement. This one, if the second derivative exists, which again means we can't be talking about this one here because the second derivative wouldn't exist here. But if it did, would we be concave down? That means we're dealing with this one. That is a true statement. So the two that would have to be true are two and three, which is letter E, okay? Six, uh, let f be a function given by f of x equals, and I give you that function, so for what positive values of a is your function going to be continuous for all real numbers? Um, so can't do much with a initially. What I would just do here is plug these in. So let's say we plug in the uh, value of 1. So if you let your a be a 1, let's factor this, mostly with limits and continuity questions. If something factors, that's probably your best bet to get this started. So if you let your a be a 1 in your denominator here, that would be x squared minus a 1. So if we factor that, we get x minus 1, x plus 1 in our denominator. If you remember, as soon as we cancel this out, what that gives us in our graph is a removable discontinuity, which basically means we have a hole in our graph at x equals 1. So when it's asking which of these is going to be continuous, x equals 1 is definitely not going to be that case. We also, right here, would have what we called an infinite discontinuity, which is at x equals a negative 1, and that's basically a fancy word 
for a vertical asymptote. So long story short, no way that's going to give us a continuous function. If we plug in the x value of 2, back to our numerator again, x minus 1, x minus 2, x plus 2. We can also get rid of this one, I suppose, because that included a 1. And then in our denominator, if you let your a be a 2 right here, you'd have x squared minus 2. So we'll go ahead and factor that as a difference of squares. That would be x plus root 2, x minus root 2. Nothing cancels, so we don't have a removable like we did in the previous problem. But what we do have are two excluded values in our denominator. x cannot equal root 2 and negative root 2. So we would also have infinite discontinuities at those two values. So 2, not an answer. You have vertical asymptotes here. And then the last one is if we let x be a 4, so x minus 1, and then x minus 2, x plus 2. Your denominator here lets your x be a 4, so when we factor that, that would be x minus 2, x plus 2. These are, oops, these are going to cancel. That means you have a hole in your graph at 2. These also cancel. means you have a hole in your graph at a negative 2. So 4 also does not work. Our answer is none. Okay? 7 would be one you could definitely do if you wanted to pause it, try it, go through that. Um, definitely could get this. Uh, the graph of the function f is shown in the figure above, which of the following statements about that function is true. So a, the limit as we approach a from both sides. So here is a from the right. Here is a from the left is going to be equal to the limit as I approach b from the right and b from the left. Well, as we approach a from both sides, our limit is 2. As we approach b from both sides, we would say that our limit does not exist. So that's false. Definitely not picking that. a, just talked about it. As I approach a from both sides, our limit is true. That's your answer. That's which one is true. Um, B, the reason this one is false is we said this limit does not exist, is what that should be. Same with this one. As we approach B, your limit does not exist. E would be the one, kind of the, the distracting answer that they would anticipate people getting, that as you approach A, your limit doesn't exist. That's just not true. Our limit is true. Um, what doesn't exist, if they would have asked for the functional value at A, that's what doesn't exist, or that's what's undefined. But we can have a limit even if we don't have a functional value, and that's what's happening here. So that's a pretty common test question. Okay, the number eight. So you've seen a bunch of these over the years, over this year. They've been extra credit questions on tests. They were on your final. This is the derivative formula. Limit as h goes to zero, and then you're given your difference quotient, f2 plus h minus f2 over h is equal to 5 which of the following must be true. So think back to your derivative formula. They like these questions to determine if you've actually done the formula at some point. So here is our derivative formula. Okay, limit as h goes to zero, f of x plus h minus f of x all divided by h. When we did these, what we would talk about is whatever is after your minus sign that is the function. So minus f of x means the function we are trying to take the derivative of would be in this position right here. That's f of x. All right. <clears throat> this is f of x plus h. So if we look at what we have up here, um, this whole statement here means we are trying to take a derivative because that is our derivative formula. So we're going to find f primed. And what we're finding the derivative at is the x-coordinate at 2. So this here, this whole thing that I have circled, is really a fancy way of saying that f prime equals 2. Then you are told that um, f prime of 2 is equal to 5. So that's really a fancy way of just saying f prime of 2 equals 5. Okay? If you understand that, then we can go to the, the options, pick those, um, get our answer. So... Really, if you go to number two first, so kind of look at number two, when it says f is differentiable at x equals two, that is 100% true. That's exactly what this is telling us, that our derivative exists here, 
add x equals 2, that derivative is 5. So number or yeah, Roman numeral number 2 is definitely true. So 2 is definitely an answer, so we can get rid of this one. Um, we could get rid of that one. So if you kind of look at your answers now, um, number 1, does our function have to be continuous? Hopefully we all know that has to be true as well because you can't be differentiable, which we are, if you're not continuous. So you can only be differentiable if your function is continuous. So this must also be true. When we look at our answers then, the only one that combines one and two together is C. So that's gotta be our answer, okay? Nine, same little setup. What this is telling us, another one that, you know, pause me real quick, see if you can do on your own. <clears throat> what you're going to find is this is your derivative formula, okay? This should look like limit as h goes to 0 with your f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. When we look at the problem that we have, what we really have is the natural log of e plus h. So notice how these match up. This is our function. So our function here has to be the natural log. So over here I would do the natural log. Our x value has to be e. And then we would do plus h and then minus our f of x all over h. The reason there is a 1 here is because we would all know that the natural log of e is in fact 1. Okay, and if we know the natural log of e is a 1, that's why you're going to get this. So what this is really telling us is, if we look through all of our options, we are trying to take the derivative of the natural log of x, that's the function we're dealing with, and we're doing it at the x value of e. If we scan our options here, the one that is saying this is letter a. Our function is the natural log, and we're trying to take the derivative of that function and evaluate it at the x value of e. All right, 10. Uh, another one I, I kind of like here. Um, you could probably figure this one out. Uh, let f be twice differentiable function such that f of 1 is 2, f of 3 is 5. So when it tells us this, so another thing to kind of just be aware of, if they tell you you're differentiable, that would guarantee that you're continuous. Okay, not necessarily vice versa, but in this case, if we know we're differentiable, you got to be continuous. They give you a couple functional values, and it says which of these, again, must be true for the function on the interval 1 to 3. So the first one's pretty simple. Um, it's an average rate of change question. We can do that very quickly. Find the average rate of change over this interval of 1 to 3. f of 3 would have been 7, minus f of 1, which is 2, all over 2. You're going to get 5 halves. That's what they're telling you this is supposed to equal. So number 1 definitely is true. So we're not picking A, we're not picking C, we're not picking E. It has to be either B or D. If you notice then, it's either 1 only or 1 and 3. So the nice thing is we don't really have to worry about even testing number two. Um, what? Uh, Hold on a second. Uh, Want to say hi to everybody? On your class? Yeah, say hello everybody. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to get on the All right. No. That was Isaiah, everybody. Good night, Isaiah. So 11... Uh, you're given a function, so let f be the integral from 0 to x squared of sine of t dt. At how many points in this interval, 0 to root pi, does the instantaneous rate of change, fancy way of saying your derivative, equal the average rate of change? So this is the mean value theorem. So instantaneous rate of change equaling your average rate of change. Um, the average rate of change would have been f of root pi minus f of 0 over root pi minus 0. Instantaneous rate of change is your derivative. So this is our little shortcut. 
if we took the derivative of this, then the derivative of the integral, so let me rewrite this over here. So here's our function. The derivative of that, these will cancel. And what we do is take our variable limit, substitute it in, so sine of x squared. And then whatever we substitute it in, chain rule wise, we need to take the derivative. So that's the derivative of our function. That then is the left hand side of this equation. So we're going to take this, drop it down, and we want to set that equal to whatever the average rate of change ended up equaling. So the average rate of change, <clears throat> um, you're going to take your function, it's just a normal composite function. You're going to take root pi and you're going to plug it in for x on the other side. So when we do that, what that would have given us is 0 to root pi squared. So my upper limit just becomes pi. And we are integrating sine of t minus take your 0. All right, we want f of 0 here. Let that become your upper limit. And then we go from 0 to 0. So anytime we do a definite integral and your limits end up being the same, we know that has to have a value of 0. And then all of that would be over root pi. So 2x sine of x squared. This would be a calculator question. So integrating 0 to pi sine of t should be something that we would be able to do on our own. But if you have the calculator in your hand, then you're being silly trying to do that on your own. One, it takes a little more time. And then it would just take, um, it, it would risk you making a mistake somewhere along the way. Um, so instead, if I can get this to work, we would want to use our calculator. And just do a quick little math nine. If you have the calculator in your hand, this would not, in their mind, be cheating. This is what they want you to do. I'm sorry, it was pi, right? Sorry. Let's get pi. And then that was sine of t, I believe, if I remember correctly. I think this was 2, if I remember. Yeah. And then we get our value to be a 2. All right. It's, so we then get 2 over root pi. So the equation we are now trying to solve, this guy, is 2x sine of x squared equals 2 over root pi. This is not one that you're going to be able to solve by hand. This will keep you busy for quite a while if you try to solve by one hand. So you have to use your calculator. So the two things you can do is you're going to either graph this one underneath y sub 1, and then the right hand side underneath y sub 2. If you choose this option, you're going to do the intersection option. Let's figure out where they intersect. If, here's the safer way I think, if we subtract that over, 2 over root pi, set that equal to 0, now we only have to graph one equation, this whole equation, and figure out where it equals a 0. I'm going to go with that option. Um, notice your interval as well is 0 to root pi because if I go ahead and graph 2x sine of x squared down, so 2x sine of x squared minus 2 divided by root pi. If we now graph that, you get a lot of create. Whoa, that's even why yikes. All right, well, that's exciting. Good luck finding all of those zeros. That'll keep you busy for a while. So that's why one of the things they will have you do, this is one of the four things that you would need to be able to do in your calculator, is to control your window. So they wanted us to only go from zero to root pi. So we would change our window to only go in that interval. And then this should be a little easier to identify. Yeah. So these have to be our, can't write on this, huh? So we ended up getting those two answers. Okay. Whatever those are going to be. We can definitely get more than one. So we do second calc zero.
Here we get. Um, gosh, I don't remember these answers. Yeah, we're in radians. Let's quit. Um, graph. Let's, let me try one more time. Second, calc, zero. So 0.851, suppose is our answer. All right, and then if we do another one, second calc, we get another answer over there within our interval. Do a second calc zero. Let's do one. this over one point six seven three all right hopefully those are right uh, those do not sound familiar to me um, so hopefully I plugged that in correctly and we're good. I left my key at school. Um, so let me just make sure I plug that in. 2 sine of, come on, 2x sine of x squared minus 2 over root pi. Yeah, so we're going to go with that. I think that's right. All right, 12, quick little average rate of change question. The reason I put this on here is just the way they've asked it. Um, so pretty simple in the sense that you're going to do an average rate of change. So we've done now that a number of times. Uh, it asks, during the fifth week of growth. So when we read these, pretty much with every problem, you just want to read it carefully and know what they're asking. If it would have asked you for the first week of growth, that interval would have been 0 to 1. That's the first week. If it would have asked you for the second week, that would then have to mean we're going from 1 to 2. So if we go third week, that would be two to three. So if they're asking you ultimately to get down to this fifth week, they're going to go four to five. All right. So for this average rate of change question, we're really doing f of five minus f of four all over five minus a four. Definitely a calculator question. You can throw that in there. Uh, whatever that gives you should be your answer. And I don't have my key and save some time plugging that in. Um, I want it was either C or D. So take your calculators out, graph that. It was one of those sixes. I think it was D, but I'll leave you that one to throw in and check on your own here. We'll save you a little time. All right, 13. If the function f is continuous for all real numbers, so our function needs to be continuous everywhere, this is our function when x doesn't equal 4. What value would your function need to equal at the x value of 4? Okay. Um, so what this is getting at, this is testing you on those functions, continuous idea. Um, basically asking you, what does f of 4 need to equal if we're continuous? Well, our test for continuity, we know we are continuous if three things are true. Our functional value needs to exist, and they're asking you, what is that? And that's the question, that's the answer. Our limit needs to exist as we approach 4. And then the third thing is uh, number 1 better be equal to number 2. Our functional value better be the same as the limit. So if we're ultimately looking for a functional value to answer this, the only reasonable conclusion we can come up with is whatever the limit is here. So if we could figure out our limit, that's supposed to be a question mark, by the way. This is as well. Whatever the limit would be, that has to be our functional value as well. So we would take this problem. I'm going to factor it while I do it. So x minus 3, x minus a 4 over x minus a 4. And what we would want to do is figure out what is the limit of this. So our first option with a limit is to substitute this in. So if I plug in a 4, um, it's going to be undefined because this is going to give us a hole in our graph. That's why we're going to define f of 4 elsewhere. But as these then cancel, we can now go ahead, throw the 4 in, and know if x gets closer and closer to 4, overall this is going to behave like a 1. 
So now we know that our limit for this function has to be a 1. Well, if 1 and 2 have to be the same, and we know the second step gives us a limit of 1, then the only logical conclusion would be the functional value better also be a 1. Okay? So that's going to be an A. 14, um, I think we're getting a little closer here. How many problems we got? Yeah, so we're getting a little closer. I know these a little longer. Ah, come on, Tony. Uh, 14, you're given a piecewise function for all those numbers. Which one of these must be true? Uh, this is, again, testing us on those continuity steps. So in order for us to be continuous, we need to have a functional value everywhere. Well, this guy by himself is fine. It's a parabola opening upwards. The vertex is 0, 5. This is a line with a slope of 7 and then a y-intercept of a negative 5. So these guys by themselves are fine. What we really just want to know is, does this parabola actually hit the line? Are we continuous at that point? Okay, so we would need a functional value at 2. Uh, we have that, that's 9. We would need a limit as our x value gets closer and closer to 2 for our function. So this is our left-hand limit. So if you plug in a 2, you would get a 9. This here is our right-hand limit. You plug in a 2, you'll also get a 9. And then the third thing is those better be equal, which obviously they are. So this is definitely a true statement. All right differentiable when we did these with piecewise functions what we did is we took their derivatives so 2x for the first term 7 for the second term and then the only way that that first parabola this x squared plus 5 parabola could turn into a line over here at 2 is kind of like in a road when you come around the turn as we get to two and as this straightens out into a line then when they meet up we better have the exact same slope at this x value so that's what we would be testing here this is our slope to the left of two immediately to the left of two as we get closer and closer to two our slope would be a four immediately to the right of two our slope is a seven we would say those are not equal. What that tells us is these guys are not meeting nice and smoothly, that when we transition from our parabola to a line, there would have been a sharp corner right here. So this guy is not true. If we ask about is there a local minimum at x equals 2, that would have told us, again, something that we'll do a little later in our reviews, at x equals 2, we would want to set up a little sign chart We've already done the work for this. To the left of 2, that was here. And we want our derivative to the left of 2. So if I took 2, I got a positive 4. So that meant my function was increasing to the left of 2. And then to the right of 2, so in this interval over here, that is this part of it. And to the right of 2, my slope is always a positive 7. So in order for us to get a minimum, we would have had to have gone or had a sign change for our derivative from negative to positive. And we don't have a sign change at all. So we don't have a minimum. We just increase the whole time over here. So the only one that is true is number one. 15, another one of these. This is one you could pause me if you want to try one on your own. Um, you could probably get this. Oh, no. Is this recording right now?
Okay, this tells me that we're still recording, so hopefully that is the case. Um, uh, if we found our limit here um, as tangent, this is another um, derivative question. Here is our formula for a derivative. Hopefully you didn't hear me curse a minute ago. And we have all this here. Limit as h goes to 0, h in your denominator. Our function is clearly the tangent. It's being thrown into that formula because we're trying to take the derivative of it. We now know what that is, secant squared of x. And we're trying to evaluate it at pi over 6. So the answer to this question should be whatever the secant squared oops, uh, pi over 6 is. So we would just evaluate that f primed of pi over 6 would equal um, 1 over the cosine of pi over 6, which is a root 3 over 2. So that's really 2 over root 3 squared. So we would get 4 thirds. All right, so then last page here. If I can get it to move. Actually, let's do 17 real quick because it's another little of these derivative formulas. Um, limit as h goes to 0. And then f of x plus h minus f of x. all over h. Um, if we look at this one, what this is telling us is our function is, again, this is your function right here, 5x to the fourth, and we're evaluating it when x is a 1 half. So take your derivative, 20x cubed, you're going to evaluate that at 1 half. So we have 20 times 1 eighth, which is 5 halves, which is A, okay? Um, 18, we'll do 16 last. It's the last one. It does take a little bit of time. 18, um, <clears throat> giving you a table. I'm telling you this is a velocity table. I'm asking you to approximate the acceleration. So we need to take a derivative. It's the biggest thing for sure, I guarantee this will be on the AP test, even the abbreviated version. You're going to need to use the average rate of change to know that we're that's how we're going to approximate a derivative. So for add velocity, you need an acceleration. That's got to be what we're going to do. So we're going to do it at four seconds. That means we're going to use the time directly in front and directly behind. And we would just want to do that average rate of change formula. So we would want f of 9 minus f of 4. In this case, our velocity at 9 minus our velocity of 4 over 9 minus 4. Use your table to get these values. Oops, I got that backwards. Oh, I messed up. Let's try this again. Quicker to just erase or cross that out. Um, so actually that part was right. No, it wasn't. Um, we, three and five are our times. So V of five minus V of three over five minus three. Our velocity at five was nine. Our velocity at three was four all over two. So that should give us five halves. You would almost always have to provide units for this. This would be millimeters per second squared. Okay. Then last but not the least, um, continuous. Our function needs to be continuous. Our function needs to be differentiable. So it's testing you on a couple of different ideas. The continuity part, we've done a few of these now. We must have a limit or a functional value everywhere. So this cubed graph by itself has no issues. It's a, it's a continuous graph everywhere. This is a regular old parabola, no excluded values, nothing that would make that discontinuous. So we're really just worried about what happens at 1. So what we would need to make sure of is do I have a functional value at 1? So here is where x is equal to 1. So we would take our 1, we'd plug it in for this x, we would plug it in for this x, and with it being a 1, that's a pretty simple little substitution f of 1 would equal a minus 6 if the x has become 1s. 2. If we tried to figure out our limit, we'd have a little bit of an issue just because we can't figure out our left-hand limit. We don't know our right-hand limit because they're both variable functions. When we set them equal, we don't know if they're the same. So instead of doing it as a two-sided limit when we did these, 
a long time ago, we would have set this up as let's find our limit from the left. And we know that better equal the limit as we approach one from the right. So our limit from the left, we would have just said, would have been the same thing, a minus a six. Here's the one that we're going to use from the right. Let your x be a one. You would get a b plus a four. <coughs> that keeps us there. We're kind of stuck. We do know those have to be equal, but we don't know what either one of them is. Okay. But we still have to deal with the differentiable part. So that part is we're going to take the derivative of that function. So if we took the derivative of these two, uh, the derivative of the first term would be 3ax squared minus 6. That's our derivative to the left of 1. And then 2bx would be the derivative to the, should not be an equal sign there, to the right of 1. Those have to be equal to each other. And at the x value of 1, where they're meeting up to make sure that we are going to be differentiable. So we would take 3a and then x squared minus a 6, and our x is a 1. That better be equal to 2bx with, again, x equaling a 1. So let me make sure to keep this separate. This would be 3a minus 6 would equal 2b. That by itself doesn't do us any good, but what we then have between these two, this equation and this equation, is just a system of equations. We are looking for a, so be careful of that because b is one of your other answers, but we need a. So what I would probably do is I would go to this equation over here, solve this for b. b is a minus a 10. Come back over to here get rid of the b so that all we have are a's left over and then we can now solve this equation to figure out what a was so we would get 3a minus a 6 oops, equals 2a minus a 20 and then a ends up being a negative 14. all right so old stuff um again hard to say exactly how this is going to play out with with it all being free response, but I would almost guarantee you're going to get an average rate of change question. Um, but again, study it all, know it all. I promise, at least normally, I would promise you that with these packets, look them over. Everything is in here. You'll be well prepared. And if you do your part, you're going to do really well on that test. So bear with me. I know these are long and you've got a lot of other stuff to be worrying about, but uh, that should be a wrap for this. Um, now I'm just going to have to figure out how I can turn this thing off. And we'll see you next time. If you have any issues, questions, reach out. I'll do my best to answer them.